mandate model reform, keeping private insurers in charge. This is actually what's going on in Washington as they're talking about a mandate model, and I want to give you a little history on this. Mandate model was first proposed by then President Richard Nixon. He proposed it in 1971 to block Edward Kennedy's national health insurance proposal. Okay. Um, what was a Republican point of view has turned into a, a rallying cry for Democrats. In a mandate model, the government uses its coercive power to make people buy private insurance. They're telling you you must turn over your money to a private insurance company. Okay. Um, now, mandate model reform uh, usually involves more than that. It's, uh, there's almost always an expanded Medicaid-like program that might be free for the poor, subsidized for low income, perhaps with a buy-in for others. Um, there's employer mandates and individual mandates. Uh, so employers have to pay a certain amount of money if they don't insure their workers. Uh, individuals have to pay money if they don't go out and buy private insurance. And all of the mandate model reforms have involved some form of managed care or care management. The problems with these models, and I'm going to go in more detail in just a moment, but to give you an idea where we're going with it, that absent cost controls, and they are absent cost controls, expanded coverage is unaffordable. Um, things that people are saying are going to work, computers, care management, prevention, whatever their other merits, those things do not save money. So you can't save money by sticking a computer in a hospital, okay? You can do, might do other things. Uh, the mandate model adds administrative complexity and cost because it retains the private insurance. It actually rewards them. And mandate models have impeccable political logic. Don't fight with the insurance companies. That's impeccable political logic, but they're actually economic nonsense, okay? They don't work economically. Now, let's talk about the Massachusetts reform, which I do think is headed toward failure. Um, in Massachusetts, this is the, the new coverage, is if you're below 150% of poverty, it's great. You, I mean, it's been helpful for those people. They've gotten a Medicaid HMO. And that's the good side of the Massachusetts reform. And the one positive thing that I would say about the national reform is there will be a Medicaid expansion, OK? Uh, above 150 to 300% of poverty, there's a partial subsidy. And above 300% of poverty, or perhaps 400%, uh, in Washington, but above 300% in Massachusetts, you're on your own. You buy your own insurance or you pay a fine. Um, now, if you go to the Massachusetts Connector website, which is the insurance exchange where you can go to purchase your insurance, your managed insurance, and you're my age, uh, you'll find that the cheapest policy available to you would have a premium of just under $5,000 annually, but if you were to get sick, you'd have to take another $2,000 out of your pocket to pay the deductible before the insurance paid a single penny. And then there's a 20% coinsurance thereafter, where you pay 20% of the bill thereafter. So you saw me graphing that before, and that's actually what we got in Massachusetts. And as you probably know, Massachusetts is considered the model for a national plan only the national coverage is expected to be a little skimpier, actually, than Massachusetts coverage. The first trial of it, uh, well, and this is Governor Romney bragging about the 2006 reform. Every uninsured citizen in Massachusetts will soon have affordable health insurance, and the cost of health care will be reduced. That's Governor Romney. I just want to point out, he said he was going to reduce costs. They now pretend like they didn't think about cost or whatever in 2006, but they promised it would reduce cost. The New York Times said the bill does what health experts say no other state has been able to do, provide a mechanism for all of its citizens to obtain health insurance. Okay. Now, in 1988, when the law was passed that mandated student insurance, uh, Governor Dukakis said something very similar. He was also running for president. He said, I'm very proud of the fact that Massachusetts will be the first state in the country to enact universal health insurance. And the New York Times then said, Massachusetts last week ventured where no state has gone before it guaranteed health insurance for every resident. And yet if we look at the uninsured in Massachusetts, and what I've done in this series of slides is this is the uninsurance rate over time. Passage of the Dukakis bill did not result in a decline in the number of uninsured. uninsured. Medicaid expansion in the late 90s did. Uh, reduce the number of uninsured somewhat if you buy more Medicaid to reduce the numbers. And passage of the Massachusetts reform so far has cut the number in half, primarily through the Medicaid expansion aspects of it. Okay. 
Oregon 1992, the governor, today our dream of providing effective and affordable health care to all Oregonians has come true. And again, this was a mandate model reform, Medicaid expansion mandate model. And Washington Post called it the most far-reaching health care reform in the nation. But if you look at the rate of uninsured in Oregon, there was no durable improvement, maybe no improvement whatsoever. Tennessee, 1992, the most radical health care plan in America. Tennessee will cover at least 95% of its citizens with health insurance by the end of 1994. And again, no durable improvement. And uh, TennCare actually included a massive Medicaid expansion and a public option, but it was not affordable and was not a durable improvement in the number of uninsured in the state. Maine, 2003, and this is the last one because you guys are going to get really bored here. But, you know, what I'm trying to say is that these plans have been tried, and they're always accompanied by uh, promises that everyone's going to be covered, that health care costs are going to be contained. They haven't worked, and we need, at some point, need to say this is not going to work. Uh, but Maine, they have their uh, Dorigo plan. It's bold, it's comprehensive, and that's the law of the state. Dorigo is actually pub mostly a public plan option. Maine has just become the first state in the union to approve a plan to provide universal access to affordable health insurance, and Dorigo has been a, a failure. Frankly. Okay, so public plan option, and, and why do they fail? They, they're passed with all this fanfare, um, and then people start to look at the real costs of trying to expand health care. Uh, in this way and find it's just too expensive and the cutbacks ensue. Now public plan option, the next disappointment. Uh, unfortunately public plan options are an old idea as well. It was proposed in 1962, 1962 uh, by Republicans Jacobs Davits and John Lindsay and these bills were proposed as an alternative to Medicare. Okay. And going to the far right, we've estimated that uh, almost $400 billion could be saved annually on administrative costs in the United States by going from the complicated system of 1,500 different insurance plans, uh, literally uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, individual uh, rules for insurance to a single public payer Medicare for All system. So if you compare current system on the far left to single payer on the far right, this I guess is about $363 billion in savings and the various aspects of uh, administrative complexity that you could get rid of by having Medicare for all. It turns out that the public plan option doesn't generate most of those savings. You're able to save a little bit on that insurance overhead, and we calculated this as half of people going into a pr public plan option. So you save some of that administrative head and uh, overhead, insurance administrative overhead and profit, which is good. Uh, that saves you almost $50 billion. But most of the rest of the administrative costs, the hospital administration, the doctor's office administration, could not be simplified because the doctor's offices and hospitals would still have to build private insurance. So the, you don't get much in the way of administrative savings from public plan option. Okay. Now, you don't have to trust me about what a public plan option will do because now the Congressional Budget Office has done an estimate, their formal estimate, on what the House public plan option would do. And according to them, the public plan option in the House bill would cover 2% of people, about 6 million total in the United States, or about 120,000 people per state. Okay, So 120,000 people per state. Premiums will be higher than those of private insurance because sicker people will end up in the public plan option. And this will cancel out the small administrative cost advantage. The premiums will actually be higher. So not speculation, the CBO is saying they're not going to cover many people, they're not going to lower costs, and uh, it's absurd to think of a public plan option controlling costs or um, providing coverage with only 120,000 people in a state. You know, the, the tail can't wag the dog. Blue Cross in the state has nearly uh, two, has about two million customers, two and a half million customers. Public plan option with 120,000 cannot control Blue Cross, and you know so that's that's where we are with public plan option. Uh, even if the Senate were willing to pass exactly what passed in the House, this is not an effective public plan option. It's it's not going to work, and if people are saying it's going to go to the right from here, uh, and when it hits the Senate, they'll make it even worse.